Awake living into uncharted territory. Together. Accelerating your wellness path. Plus, your interconnectivity at the same time. It's not your grandmother, your Veda, but it kind of is. It's the Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Hey, it's Kate Stillman, and welcome back to the Yoga Healer Real Life Show. On today's show, Don Jose Ruiz, Toltec master, son of Don Miguel Ruiz, author of New York Times bestseller, Four Agreements. And I just got to say, I had a blast. You'll hear it in the conversation. I had a blast with Don Jose. He's so in it. Don Jose is the author of The Fifth Agreement, Ripples of Wisdom, and my good friend, The Rattlesnake. He's a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage. It's cool. He tells stories about his grandma in this episode. He teaches workshops and offers transformational journeys. And I got to say, just being with him, you get you get a hit. You get a hit of of ancient lineage. It's awesome. You'll hear it. You'll hear it in this. And so yeah, today we talk a little bit about ancient lineage and and coming into being with book and and what's going on with a lot of people and why people are kind of addicted to their own suffering and what it means for him to be a messenger. All that in today's episode. Stay tuned. Today's podcast is brought to you by my Living Ayurveda course. If you're curious about the power of Ayurvedic wisdom in your daily life, you're listening at the right time. As a Yoga Healer Real Life Show listener, you're invited to my preview training on the most progressive training available globally for living Ayurveda. To get in on my free video preview training, go to yogahealer.com forward slash A-Y-U-R-V-E-D-A. You will learn a ton. I'm here with Don Jose Ruiz. So good to be with you. Oh, so great to be here with you too. <laughs> and I've got to tell you guys, I, I'm I'm on the video with Don Jose, and he's absolutely just this peaceful, vibrant beingness. I just feel so present in your presence that uh, it's cool because I do a lot of interviews, and it's it's just it's cool to feel <laughs> your vibe. Oh, it's just the, the love. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, will you just talk a little bit about life with your dad? Well, love my that was very beautiful because he, he was always um, showing an example that everything is possible when you believe in yourself. And many times I didn't believe in myself, and uh, and make things that I didn't want possible possible. You know, it's in, in the doubting of myself. You know, but then he always said, you know, we we have a, a strong intent, my son. We humans have strong intent. So always be careful what you intend for because that might create a, a reality. But seeing with my father is that everything is possible because when you believe in you, uh, 100% in your work, it's not that you're doing it out of ego or doing something. It's that you want to give something of your art, something to experience in life. And that's the beautiful thing about possible. But, but what it really taught me is that everything is possible to get out of, out of a moment, of a negative moment. And the beautiful thing about my father teaching me is that we're all family. No matter we're blood related, it's all about family and being there for one of us, but we cannot be for somebody if we're not there for ourselves first. So this is one of the beautiful gifts about being my father. And I always have to think twice when I ask my father something, because in the middle of me asking, he's already taking action and I can't <laughs> go back. <laughs> <laughs> Do I want to stir this pot in my own evolution right now? That's So I mean, there's a few things that you just said that really are sparky for me. So one is that there are certain things that our parents can't pass on to us that we need to learn. And so your dad, yes. who had already realized so much and written so much and internalized and metabolized, <clears throat> he couldn't he couldn't live your lessons for you. And but he could help you navigate your own path through those lessons in a way that might have been faster than if you had had a father that was a lot more shut down, who hadn't really accessed those truths of that. Like our, our what we intend is what we end up creating. Yes, like my like my father always said, you know, we cannot give what we don't have. So he always give me good, good examples, good points, you know, but he knew, always knew that if I don't educate my son, somebody else will. So he gave me all these techniques and, you know, and every son or daughter will rebel at a certain age Yes. and you no, know, and, and move away. But then, you know, when you're in a dark times and um, you see the negativity around you that's eating you, and then you begin listening to the points of your parents that really love you, you know, that really are there for you. Even though, you know, like my brother says that, when their parents, no one gives them any instructions how to be a parent. They just get into it, you know, so they do their best. And it's nothing that they do ill intention of doing it to us. It's that they're just what they were teach us, teach us. So if we were born in a legacy that was negative, you know, and cruel, you know, and, and we wake up from that, you know, 
it's a beautiful thing that we can wake up from that because we can end the legacy because the little kids are watching us and we can change our legacy of our lineage, of our family. And this is the beautiful thing about, you know, owning where we're at. But that's why my father teaching me, he always gave me the truth, you know. And uh, every time that I reacted, it was my ego reacting. It was the liar in me reacting because the peaceful truth doesn't care to react. He just cares to be and witness everything. Yeah. It's so much more absorptive, isn't it? Like a, like a sponge that can just take in and make room than something that has to like push back or or debate on or be the antithetical to. Yeah, it's like the defending. And like that's, that's one always thing I always did when my father gave me a, an instruction and I took it for granted, almost dogmatic, you know. And then he gets, no, that's not the correct son. This is, I was just only kidding to you. So you can be aware. So I go, no, this is it. This is this is it. And then I, I watch myself reacting. And, you know, if it was, it was really in peace, I wouldn't be defending it at all. And it's a beautiful thing about sometimes, you know, we, we don't believe in ourselves 100%. We believe in ourselves 90%. But that 10% really take away from us to believing in, in ourselves because that we live in blind faith. And when we live in blind faith, we're easy to be broken by the word. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, the difference too, in that 10% differential, right? To me, that's where exponential growth and exponential value and exponential impact start to happen. Right. And, and like, when I look at people that have really had a profound impact on their lives, it's like that it, it is what separates, right. The, the people that have just like, you look back and you're like, how did they do that <clears throat> in their life? And we can just be in awe, right. Because they, they were willing to go that extra 10% into their own stuff, like into their own limitations, into their own outdated beliefs. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, it's like one of my friends, uh, Stephen, said to me once, you know, when we were walking, you know, when we're in the midst of pain or heartbreak or in our fall and in our, in our 10%, let's say, you know, we, we're not, we're not, we, have no, we don't have any idea why we're there. But then when we cross it and we pass that percent and we make it 100% and we're believing us, you know, every negative thing that we went through, where we lost ourselves, it was meant to be because it teaches some teachings to that we can express later on in life. Like I remember when I was a kid, and I believe all these lies in order to become an adult that you have to have pain, suffering, drama, uh, you know, and all these things in your life, you know, to be an adult. If I could speak to that Jose, you know, it's not a reality. I cannot speak to that 11 year old Jose, but I can speak to other kids because I went through that, you know, as we all went through certain things in life because we have the experience, and experience is the real teacher in life. And, and the beautiful thing is always to share how we return back home. That's the beautiful thing. Yeah. It, re it reminds me of that acronym FAIL, F-A-I-L, for first attempts in learning, right? As a, as, a, as a turn, as a more elevated way of understanding failure, right? It's like if we can't, if we aren't willing to lean in to what we don't know yet and become the person that we're maybe a little bit like totally apprehensive, self-doubting, blah, 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 right? All that stuff comes up. And if we're not, if we're not willing to fail, if we're not willing to have, and to me, like first attempt is like really the next attempt in learning because it's attempt after attempt after attempt in my yeah. personal experience of it. Yes. And, and it's magical when we learn how to overcome the tyrant and the tyrant's not outside of us. It's, it's the inner tyrant. When we lose ourselves, when we get all this, you know, the, the adult tantrum, you know, we might yeah. say, you know, yeah. the beginners, we overcome that. That's the magical thing because we learn how to control our poison. We learn to control our negative things. But at a certain time is when we learn how to grow because learning how to grow is letting of that go. And sometimes we don't know how to grow because we're not letting go of things that are eating us alive. But the moment that we get comfortable in discomfort, just like the magic of yoga, like the discipline of yoga, we get comfortable in discomfort. We can learn to breathe through those difficult situations. And then we pass ahead, but now we just have the memories of how we used to go against ourselves, how we used to go against the tyrant. And this is when I make a prayer every day that I wake up, may life protect me from myself because one day is harder than other days. But the moments that are harder days is to really, you know, to look for the help that we need, you know. If we feel this heaviness sensation, because it's a heaviness sensation, you know, that is the automatic habit of the, of the fall. When we notice this decision is happening, it's right away, you know, in the in the Alcoholic Anonymous, they call it, you know, call your sponsor, you know, call someone who cares yeah, about yeah, you. Reach in, out. In the yeah. Reach out. Reach out and get away from those thoughts because we are our, our worst tyrant. But once we overcome our own tyrant and we know how to trick ourselves, you know, we, we are ahead because that's what I call uh, out of body experience, you know. And, and I don't mean the one that I you sleep at night and, you know, you bloat. I had that when I was 12 years old mm. and it didn't help me at all in my life. It was just a dream. <laughs> But to really see your automatic habits, how we go against ourselves with our own work, that's the magic right there. Because 
we identify that we are our own time. And so with the work, we can overcome it. Yeah. I know when I was first studying yoga and they, they broke down the levels of, of the mind in, in this map that's been around for a few thousand years. And they're like, this is, this is, this ego level is, is reliant on these certain systems. And yet there's this whole other level of the part of the mind that's connected to universal wisdom. And they're like, you want to start to live more there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like, let's, let's hear. And you want to identify when you're in that egoic, that self, that that self it's really that self-centered that inward pointed place instead of being a grounded but connected place and and to me it's it's so crucial right and and i notice even after whatever how many years of, of studying yoga practicing yoga meditation etc it's like it's a daily it's really a daily connect in because the ego is so so pernicious and my guess is like just because of how we evolved as a species like there's just having some of these self-contracted tendencies for revival were super helpful along the way. But now we're at a place where it's like, okay, if we have access to this kind of wisdom and teachers and teachings, and we have a little bit of time to devote to our own personal evolution, to be able to connect, be connected a little bit more to the part of us that's connecting all of us together and connecting us to a, a deeper reality of who we are and, and pull ourselves away from, or, you know, a, a, not away from the tyrant, but absorb and digest the tyrant. So we get into so some right relationship to the rest of reality, which is like a really good response if, um, if you're in ultimate survival mode. But other than that, probably not necessary. And you might never really need it for the rest of your life, uh, which I think is true for a lot of people listening here. Where it's like, it's just, it's almost like a uh, vestigial organ. Yes, absolutely. It's like we wake up in a garden of Eden, not the one that they told us when we were growing up. But the real garden of Eden is, is our mind, because that's where we live. And inside there, there's a tree of knowledge with a little snake offering you an apple. And that apple is a temptation to taste the negative. And, you know, sometimes we taste it and it's OK. You know, how will we learn if we don't taste it? Yeah. But after we taste it, we can identify. And like you said, this work, you know, once we begin it, we never end it because it's a daily service. Every moment service that the garden needs to be clean. And not because it was clean once, you know, very clean and won an award five years ago. That's it's going to be like that every, every day. You know? We have continuously working on it, working on it, because where there's that much love, there is much that negative. And when mm. we are uh, open our heart with honesty, we can identify the first rule of happiness is that we're not happy all the time. And why this is the first rule? Because the moment that we become unhappy, we identify that it's just an emotion that is triggering like a little snake offering the apple that we bit. Now we have to unlearn to not kick ourselves out of the Garden of Eden because nobody kicked us out. We kick ourselves in a daily basis. Yeah. But the moment that we learn how not to date out and being honest in and know that there's nothing to be judged about in the world, you know, because I notice in the world when we become teachers, the teacher gets corrupted because he thinks it is perfect for its other people to not be judged. So yeah. he begins to lose itself, you know, it becomes living an authentic life. But the moment that the teacher becomes authentic, you know, with every emotion that's happening, you're free from yourself. So in that moment, the heart begins opening and the authentic teacher rises up. But the real reason of the teacher is to learn from the apprentice. In, in both of us, it's just us, the interaction between learning and unlearning. And from this point on, we can go into our garden and honestly, with open heart, clean it. And yeah. just so, you know, sometimes we fall. Sometimes we break a word. A, a word. And that is perfect, too, because we, that... The moment that we stand back up, it just makes our work even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, th this, it, it's, it's teaching in yoga about that. Like, it's like you, it's like you have to cloak yourself to reveal like the, the nature of consciousness is such that like in order to experience the joy of revelation, <laughs> it has to experience the joy of, of cloaking. Right. And like, or, or so sorry, not the joy of cloaking, but the misery of cloaking and that there's increasingly subtle, subtle and deeper deeper levels of this. But I, I want to touch on a few things that you said. And, and one that I notice is coming up so much in, in the evolution of, uh, of the work that I've been involved in at Yoga Healer and Yoga Health Coaching is this mentoring. Like mentoring has become such a core component of how all of our programs run because we notice that at a certain point, the people that have come through certain levels of of their own personal evolution through the coursework and whatnot, they get to a point where if they don't teach it, if they don't pass that forward, they're, they plateau, yeah. right? And that, 
and that in that, in passing it forward and in, in, in connecting and desiring to help and bring someone else up, it, it's like, it, it is that back and forth. It's multiple level. It creates a lot more too of the sort of, hor- I call it the horizontal structure of support where it's like a little bit less of like, member to leader, but it's just member to mentor and having that additional like stepping stone where there's maybe a little bit less of projection involved uh, because it's just a mentor, just someone, just like a big brother helping you out. It doesn't have to be like the big father figure or something, right? <laughs> like the priest, right? It's just like the the bro, the older bro, help. that there's something in this. And, and, and to me, this part of sort of societal, structural, tribal evolution is just totally lost in the modern education system and culture in general and whatnot. So that like children and teens are not looking for their mentor and that mentors aren't looking for the youngsters to connect with. And this whole part of our, our psyche of humans is like, it's disrupted. We're in like a dysfunctional disruption is, is my sense. What's where would you go with that? Yes. Because one of the beautiful things is that people have lost the feeling of giving. You know, when we share something that was given to us, it's like we're not giving to somebody, we're receiving it because those people receiving it are giving us the gift to receive it 10 times what we built. Like every time I get the opportunity to speak in public, I can totally feel my grandmother giving it to me twice. So it may feel the feeling that I'm giving a gift to those 10 people, but no, those 10 people give me a gift by showing up, by listening, and then I begin listening and then I notice that I'm just speaking to myself. It's a self-reminder. And you know, the moment that we give... um uh, uh, open our hearts and express what is in it. It's like going to church. It's like going to sermon. It's like going to mass. It's going into the spiritual temple that allows us to be respectful. And it's a, it's a sad thing, you know, that we grow up knowing that only certain places in the world are sacred. When the honestly is wherever we go, we're sacred. And when we get heaven inside of us, we know that we are heaven and you know who needs heaven? Hell. So wherever we go, we're taking heaven with us and converting it into heaven just by our presence. And it's not necessary that we have to word or convert anybody. It just could be with our smile, with our open heart. No matter if we're in difficult moments in time, just open our heart and smile to somebody. Make us remember this, the source of our smile. And we get to smile once again because, you know, we're so intelligent as humans that we will create any excuse, any justification, you know, to make a victim story, to keep it alive, to not give that smile that is genuinely ours and to believe it because at the end of that moment, it's just stories passing by us. And we hook to us. And it's like my father told me once, Jose, the main problem with you in your life, what moment he said to me that moment is that you're addicted to suffering and that you look anything in your life from the outside dream and do the inner dream to look at you, to hurt yourself. And then from that point, you don't look at anybody else. That's why you can talk to somebody's pain. And instead of talking about their pain, listening to their heartbroken, you just make it about yourself mm-hmm. because you begin blaming in your pain. But the moment that you begin noticing that you're hurting yourself, that you don't longer want to be the scorpion that's talking with his own stinger, then you begin to be, again, impeccable with the word. And then something happens when you begin practicing the impeccability of the word is that you begin to think impeccably. You begin to think before you, you say, this is why I say once you wake up, you cannot go back to sleep. But yet again, it is difficult. It is difficult to live in life where everybody else is asleep. When we get back on... Jose Ruiz talks about what it's like to be in charge of your life journey. Stay tuned. We all have body goals. We all want radiant longevity. We all want to feel vibrant, lean, grounded. You can have a free body goal session. Get clear on what you want. And we'll let you know if we can help you get there. We'll also give you some free resources to get you going on your body goals. If this sounds good, go to yogahealer.com forward slash body dash goals. You'll you'll talk to Lori, who's a yoga health coach. She helps people deeply identify what their body goals are. Often they're not what we think they are. We might think something like very superficial, like I want to lose 10 pounds, but underneath it, there's a deeper body goal. There's a deeper body goal, maybe around how you want to feel in your body, maybe what you want your body mass to be like. The losing part isn't actually what it's about at all. This can be transferred to any kind of experience. Like you might say, like, I just want to get a good night's sleep. But underneath that really is wanting to have a deep reservoir of energy in your cellular structures, feeling that deep energy in your bones. So whatever it is, we'll help you get in touch with that. And in the getting in touch, you actually tap in to your desire for body integrity. You tap into your own body wisdom. You awaken your intuition. So it's my delight to be able to offer you these free sessions for you to identify what your body goals are in this next chapter of your life. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash body dash goals. 
Right. Yeah, right. So with each a few things that you've said I really want to pull out. And like one is that the way that you relate is and, and you've learned this. Like this this is just part of the beauty of being part of a auspicious lineage, right? And being part of the Toltecs is like you you learn from your father, you learn from your grandmother, you learn from your grandfather a perspective, right? Of seeing all as family. And you call me sister and I'm like, this I'm down with this dude. Like I got I got a bro here, right? And so we have a way of connecting with so many more circuits connected, right? And yes. And, and so when you see, so when you're at the gas station or at the grocery store or whatnot, it's just a totally different operating system. It's a totally different way of of moving through life with circuits open, with an ear to empathy. Because that's what I heard you talking about when we left off. Is like really leaning into having a felt experience of what someone else's poison may be or how someone else's tyrant might be throwing a little fit storm or you know, and 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 having compassion to be like, oh man, I know what that's like. I, yeah. I'm not above that either, <laughs> right? And there's yeah. this, and maybe I have some tools to deal with it that I can, if appropriate, lend or, you know, make available or, or whatnot. And maybe the tool is just like, hey, can I just, can I just open my circuits to you? Yes, because you know the first thing to understand is one something that I learned in life is that when people are mean to us, when they're screaming at us, when they're just reacting to us like snipping like a snake, yeah, is that they're really asking for help. They yeah. react. They don't know what to do with their pain. They're just re- asking for help. So the best thing they can know to do is just begin hurt and numb themselves with pain and hurting pain and thus in their temple. So if we feel it, we feel the ouch, but we don't take it personal that we want to hurt that person back. Yeah. We just step yeah. away. The, 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 the hands stop clapping. The fight stops happening. And, you know, the dream begins to rebuild little by little. Of course, we will feel the ouch, you know, we feel the shakiness, the yeah. nervous system broken down. But yeah. this is where we take care of ourselves, but not really the story that allows us to go back and forth. Yeah. To take a little temple. And this is why I really enjoyed the story of Jesus of Nazareth when he goes to the desert to talk to the, to the devil, to the snake. It's because he's going out there to be by himself. So he doesn't corrupt anybody with his own pain because his, his word is so powerful with love. If it's hurt, his word can be also damaging. So he knew how to control itself. And this is like the rattlesnake. When the rattlesnake is young, you know, it doesn't know how to control its poison. But when it grows up, it learns how to control its poison. It doesn't mean it doesn't have poison. No, it has more poison than before. Mm. We learn how to control it, just like we humans. We were younger. We didn't know how to control the emotional poison. Right. We didn't know how to heal. And we grow up and have awareness. We get a poison and we learn how to control it. So if there's something going on inside of us, and we say to our loved ones, to our partners, okay, give me a break. Give me half an hour before I say something that I do not mean. Or, you know, let me get, let me center myself first. Yeah. That's an honesty. And I don't care what level of awareness we are in humanity, yeah. of levels of awareness. We all human, we always will feel that. Yeah, and, right. I mean, it's just part of the, it's just part of our architecture. So, I mean, the other, the other part of that is like when it's coming at us, when someone else's venom is coming at us. I mean, one of the things that I find so helpful is just giving it space. I mean, we have, we're in an expanding universe. There's no limitation of the field of space. And so to, to internalize it and personalize it and decide to give it, give that venom a location within us is not necessarily a, to me, like an intelligent way to go about it. When there's infinite space out here to absorb and to recycle and to, you know, refilter, whatever, it's like the permaculture effect of like, oh, don't worry, like the elements can handle this. The elements can handle. And, and then there's a, a sense of, like, hey, it's okay. It's okay that we're not always we're not always perfect, and then we learn how to do that within ourselves too. Of just like, okay, there's a lot coming up right now for whatever reason, and instead of putting it on for me, it comes out on like my team. My team gets the worst of me. But instead, if I could just be like, okay, can I just give this some space and reconnect with what we're trying to do here, and then relate to you know relate from an honest place of you guys, I'm really struggling with this right now. Then there's a place for for connection, just because I've opened the field of space. And to me, it's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about this, like where time and space inter- intersect. Because when the story in Nazareth, right, go, go into the desert, there's travel, which happens across time and space. So there's a movement from here to there into, into the vast, right, into the infinite, if you will, because you can keep walking and walking forever. Like we can yeah. circle the earth and right. And anyone who's done like a long walk about to an unknown destination, it's like, you can always keep going. 
right? And so we give ourselves some time and some space. And what, what we find right now is with the sort of like instant data overload generation, right? Where people are not giving silence. They're not, they're not taking walks in solitude, right? They may have their earphones in. They're not uh, allowing this processing that is confusing the nervous system and leading to anxiety and overwhelm and autoimmune diseases and all sorts of horrible afflictions, right? So what's some of your take on this, on this sort of like where time and space and connectivity and being in your heart, like how does that all tie together for you? Yes, because the, we're, we're, wherever we put our attention, that is where we're going to perceive. And the ancestors used to call this opening the vortex. So if uh -huh. I put my attention into hurting myself and I'll bring all the infinite potential to hurt myself with it. And you know, we're very creative. We find many ways. <laughs> But, uh, but you know, when we when we start doing that, it's because we're not happy. So this is when the little angel within us wakes up, the guardian angel, because when we pray, the angel listens. And we're doing a prayer inside of us. Who's listening? We are. So we are that angel. So we begin filtering what's coming from the infinite, the negative, and being skeptical about it. Not believing, say, okay, I'm not perfect. Okay, I cannot change. Okay, I don't believe that. You know, no one loves you. I don't believe you that. Even though I feel it, I don't believe that. And that makes you so strong because... We're creators, and that's what artists means. Toltec. Toltec is artists of the spirit. That's what we mean. It's not a religion. It's a way of life to really understand how we can have a conversation with the creator. And a conversation with the creator is not in words. It's through emotion. If our bodies feel pain or nervous or happy, it's the divine talking to us. And we wake up that powerful word, no longer to be victim, but know that that word is a seed. And that's our attention. And we and we put our attention to it. That's what's going to happen. That's why I love the pictures of a nun or a priest in a monastery when they have a dagger in their heart, but they're still looking up into the heavens in prayer mode because nothing's going to break their faith, no matter how painful the situation it is, because they have found the divine within themselves. And when you find the divine within yourself, you know they are a service to heaven. And that's the angels dream to serve the, the, the heaven and our body is heaven. Or it could be hell too, because that's where we live. So when let's 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 break this down a little bit further, going a little deeper to when the feeling becomes the word, because the, to me there's a lot in in various uh, perennial wisdom traditions that really dive deep into this, right? Because we have a feeling, and then there's the like by the time we're in prayer, we're in words. We're now in thought structures. We're now we're now using thought structures, which are very different than feeling emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it's, it's like the fireman would say, when the fire gets a certain size in the forest, it has life of its own. And our knowledge, our words, when they get a certain degree of size, it has life of its own. And that's when our thinking becomes like a wild horse. And if we put attention to that wild horse that is leading us down the cliff, it will, if we follow it, it will get us down the cliff. But in the moment that we begin taming that wild horse, taming that mind, which is just stories which they're not real. The emotion, it is real, but the story is not. And it's when you get back into center. I know it's big, it's big challenging for many people, but when you're in honesty with yourself, when you want to change out of guilt or shame, when you really want to change because you don't want to suffer anymore, then it's not going to be difficult. It's going to be an act of love because a jaguar who's trapped in a cage it's not thinking what it's going to do once it's free. It's just thinking to get out of the cage. And the moment that you get out of the cage, you really know that you are a service with you. This is why it's so beautiful to know that we are in charge of the love of our life journey. Because once we wake up, we know the meaning of our life. And the meaning of li the life for me, personally, my own dream is that I'm here to take care of Jose. Because I know what makes Jose suffer and I know what makes Jose happy. And how do I know this is because I am Jose? And, you know, and sometimes I fall, you know, sometimes I do my best, but then I pick myself up. And the important thing is to not judge myself, to continue on. Because sometimes, you know, we fall and it was, it's okay. We're perfect with our fall. We're perfect. We have fallen before, that we will fall in the future and are falling now. But the beautiful thing is to pick ourselves up and say, it's okay. And continue the journey because in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn, but to unlearn what takes our inspiration away. One day at a time, honesty will transform our life that one day we're going so forward that we look at the past and we say, oh, my God, we've overcome so many things. Mm. And when you overcome your biggest, you know, demon, your biggest negativity, then you can overcome anything because now you know that you're a service to heaven and you are heaven. You're the love of your life and you're your guardian angel. 
And this is the meaning of our life to wake up in a world where everybody's completely asleep. But we wake up for some reason, and here we are now. And now here's the beautiful thing that we know that we're not alone because, you know, we work for the same boss. You and I sit work for the same boss. And, and, and we will connect with everybody who works with the same boss. It's positivity. Yeah. And we know that we're in the same team. No yeah. matter if we have different belief systems, but we're both wanting to end the addiction of suffering in this world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's easier when we're, you know, it's like as more people wake up to that, it's it's easier to make more cool things happen in shorter periods of time. Like that's one of the things that I notice is that there's, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, yes, there's, inc- there's, there's plenty of suffering. I mean, obviously, if we look at disease statistics, uh, just it's, it's sad, really. I mean, when I look at like just the number of people that are carrying more, more toxicity in their own physiologies, just through how their, their habits, their daily habits are right. And, and then how much that toxicity shuts, shuts them down, shuts down their circuitry and, yeah. and creates a lot of pain. And, and yet at the same time, there's this, you know, very much this dynamic growing group of people and versions of consciousness where we're like more and more people are more awake to living their own lives on their own terms as being brutally honest uh, with themselves and being able to express more vulnerability with each other. Like, Hey, I don't know how to do this. Do you have any idea? Cause I'm open, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and if you're curious about this, like what can we make happen together? And, and there's more to me, there's, there's also more of that happening at the same time, right. Where we have this, this, uh, in some ways, predictable paradox because of the paradoxes that have arisen in history uh, over time. And and it's like we, if we can absorb all of it and in some way be okay with all of it, we actually tap into a whole other experience of like, what do I want to do next? Like, what do I want to shape next? What do I want to see happen in the world and this planet between us all next? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's very important what we put into our temple too. Like you were saying, sister, like the, the, the foods that we put into, because sometimes we put food into that's toxic and it makes us have depression with not any reason. And we know we just ate, we can just say we, we just ate the corn from a can with all these preservatives and we didn't know what we got up at something happened inside that can or they put something into the meats, you know, they put something into many other things, you know, that we don't know that it's now time we, we learn how to get away the parasite, but now we have to listen how the body's feeling with certain foods that we eat, you know, and if we're, taking the, if we're taking the body for a walk too, because the moment that we do exercises, it creates happy thoughts too. Yeah. So there's many ways things to, to really rescue ourselves. It's just not with the, with, with, the, with the words, because sometimes our words are created by, like you're saying, toxins. Yeah, yeah. So I want to, I, I want to, you've done so much work with symbols and your, your, your ancestral tradition has so many powerful symbols and, and, and a lot of uh, well-developed use of them. So tell us a little bit about this, especially in terms of where emotions and words, just to come back to that a little bit, like where are symbols and emotions and words, how, how those all kind of work together and how, how you have tapped into the power of symbols on your, on your life path. Well, the power symbol is very powerful. Like any painting, any cloud passing by, you can see art there. And that we create a, a really perfection um, image that you can tell a story to of what this painting is telling to you. And the moment that that happens, you begin to bring from the unmanifest where dreams are born from your heart. And you begin feeling a dream. You can be feeling how you overcome yourself. You put it into words and you have a story to put out there. And it's so beautiful there that we don't know what, what it can be happening. Like uh, the other day, I was with my grandmother who has Alzheimer's and I was going through a situation. But when I got there, she just told me two words and then forget about herself again. But those two words really put a seed that, you know, put a symbology in my in my in my mind that helped me overcome the situation, you know, where I was kind of stuck. But, you know, we can see the symbols going and put 10 persons in front of a painting. That painting will describe 10 different things to each person. Because we are reflecting, projecting what's inside of us, inside any everything. So this is a beautiful thing about seeing the power of symbology. There are there are mirrors, and what are we reflecting to ourselves? That's why in the FIFA agreement we say um, we are messengers. But the question it is, what kind of messenger are we, and what's the message we're giving to the people we say we love with all our hearts? I love it. I mean, because so much of what I'm hearing is that there's a there is an object an objectivity we can. It's like we're taking ourselves from from the 
viewer to someone who's actually able to see the reflection back of like, oh, and we can actually in- reinterpret our own this our own stories that we're telling ourselves. And I've done this a lot with, so I, c- I come from a background of Ayurvedic medicine where we've really involved the five elements. And I'll often look to the sky or to, I, I live uh, on the ocean part-time, so I'll look to the water or when I'm living in the mountains, I'll look to the mountains and I'll, I'll notice what I'm noticing so I can see the story that's in my head. And often there's a in interpreting that story, there's some big ahas. Like, and, and some of it is like a core current of truth, and then some of it is is some of that like just the snake and the poison and the <laughs> the you know the like ooh I'm um, I'm misinterpreting reality a little bit here. Yes, the, the revelations begin happening when we enter our hearts, and especially a place of power like the ocean, like the mountains, the sky, the fire. It begins rebuilding. You know our our our, our emotions mm-hmm. that we have a revelation, a re- and, the, and having the revelation, that's when we know what we have to change or want to change, and what we keep and you know are grateful for. But this is the moment that you know revelations are so powerful in our life that sometimes we don't want to look at them, but when you're ready to look at them, you know we can make our life a masterpiece of art for the better. Yeah, yeah, and, and I imagine a lot of the power of your of your living your tradition you're living your lineage is is helping people connect back to to the elements come back to the clouds to the earth to to what they're noticing so that they can tap into the power of universal consciousness so they can tap into some of their archetypal uh mental patterning right and they can start to they can start to receive directly instead of needing the sort of like the middleman of the you know the middleman of the of the teacher we can you know like you were saying we're all working for the same boss Booyah. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I just want to thank you all for listening and sharing this show because then I get to talk to cool people like Don Jose Ruiz and bring him what I think our community wants to know and what our community wants to experience of him. So namaste to you all. Even if this is the first show you've listened to, I'm psyched you're here. Thank the friend who recommended it. If you've recommended this to a friend, thank you really deeply. Like that's that this whole deal here is word of mouth. And I'm, I'm just so glad we're growing and that people are interested because we get to talk to more interesting people. If you want to request someone on the show, send an email to podcast at yogahealer.com. And the biggest way that you can be of service to me, if you're curious about that, um, is just to rate the show. Just to rate the show. just be, And even if you think it sucks, like rate the show so that we know and how we can make it better. Um, if you think it's awesome, let us know that too. Go to iTunes, rate the show, subscribe to the show if you like it. Namaste. Have a great day. Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Yoga Healer.